We need a new system. We need a new society. We need to demand that which may have sounded impossible even a few weeks ago, but is not only realizable, but an imperative necessity. From socialism in one country to the era of global class war, today we'll examine the Soviet Union after World War II. Welcome to this week's episode of The Real Story on the Socialist Program. I'm your host, Ryan Becker. Today we'll continue our multi-part series on the rise and fall of the Soviet Union and lessons for socialists. This will be our fourth episode. We'll be talking again with Carlos Martinez, he is the author of the book, The End of the Beginning, Lessons of the Soviet Collapse, and he's the editor of the political analysis site, inventthefuture.org. Carlos Martinez, welcome back. Thanks, Brian. Great to see you again. Well, we've covered a lot of territory in the first three episodes. Uh, last time we ended with the close of World War II, of course, the Soviets uh, in spite of all odds, prevailed against the Nazi invasion. The Soviets took on 80% of the German military uh, and defeated it and launched the biggest counteroffensive in human history, liberating Eastern and Central Europe from the scourge of fascism, liberating people who were in the death camps, but at great cost, 27 million Soviets died. And the impact on Soviet agriculture, Soviet industry, was immense. So we want to be able to talk about what comes next after World War II. And of course, the magnitude of the violence in World War II was such that the old world order basically collapsed. The colonial empires started to unravel. National liberation movements uh, took off all over the world, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, in the Middle East. And there were new socialist revolutions. The Soviet Union had been the sole single socialist country. There was a debate within the Soviet party, as we talked about last time, about the theory of socialism in one country versus permanent revolution or whatever the, the iteration was. The reality was the Soviet Union was the only socialist country. But after World War II, we have the creation of the socialist camp the beginning of what is known in Western media as the Cold War, what we're going to call the global class struggle or the global class war. We want to talk about what World War II and how, uh, how it impacted both the capitalist world but also the socialist world. We're going to do all that. But before we do, just in order to, I don't know, go back to Karl Marx's famous quote from the 18th Brumaire that history repeats itself uh, first as tragedy and then as farce, uh, you can't but come to the conclusion that the era that we're living through after the collapse of the Soviet Union, after the breakup of what had been the so Sino-Soviet alliance in the 1950s that changed global politics, uh, Russia, no longer led by a communist party, and China now led or is continuing to be led by a communist party, they have forged a new alliance and in some ways, the post-World War II Cold War is starting to look very much like the new Cold War, even though there have been a lot of political changes. And just so that it's not too heavy when we get started, I thought, let's play the opening ceremony of the Olympics, the Beijing Olympics 2022, uh, the Winter Games in Beijing, because when you listen to how NBC covered this sporting event, we have an audio clip, it's not long, it's about 40 seconds, you get a sense of how the Western media is presenting Russia and China. It sounds a lot like the Western media in 1950. Anyway, let's listen to this audio clip just to get started. China is determined to go ahead with these games in the middle of the pandemic to showcase its competence, its high-tech prowess, and its state power. There will be geopolitics. Watch out for the two most powerful authoritarians in the world in the VIP box sitting side by side. Chinese President Xi Jinping, Russian President Vladimir Putin. They have a close relationship. 
they formed an axis of power to challenge the United States. One of the big questions hanging over these Olympics is whether Putin will send his armies and his tanks into Ukraine while the competition is going on. And if he does that, will Xi Jinping support him? If that happens, we could be living in a very different world. Okay, that's bizarre. I mean, they're watching the Olympics, or they're about to. It's the opening ceremony. So they're postulating, will Vladimir Putin send his armies, 1.4 million members, while he's watching a skiing event into neighboring Ukraine? And will his authoritarian ally Xi Jinping from China back him up? And if they do, if they invade, and if China supports Russia, it's going to be a different world, Carlos. I mean, again... This is so bizarre. This is the way the American media is treating the opening of the Olympic Games. Nothing about the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. It's talk like this. Anyway, let's get started. Yeah, I think it's a great point. You know, it's all, um, you, you get a definite sense of deja vu that you had this NATO as, as the sort of basic military architecture of the Cold War, the original Cold War. Um, and it's now coming to form along with AUKUS, along with the Quad, the military architecture of the new Cold War. Um, and, and as you say, it's becoming extremely clear with the current crisis in Ukraine. And, you know, you, you put these organizations together, NATO, AUKUS, and the Quad, and you've got a, essentially a global setup for encircling and containing China and Russia, um, you know, very similar to the role that NATO was playing 50, 60, 70 years ago. Um, I, you know, what, what's... What's positive about about the the audio that you played for a kind of nostalgic old, old Marxist such as myself, and I suspect yourself, is to see how close Russia and China are these days. I mean, they're probably closer than they've been since what 1955. Uh, you know, you, you didn't get to hear broadcasts like that about Mao and Brezhnev. So that's a that's a really interesting uh, you know global political dynamic. Is this uh, increasing alliance between Russia and China, which have got different political systems now. You know, Russia's uh, a capitalist country, but these two countries, along with progressive force in Latin America, along with Iran, are forming, you know, the the nexus of a new multipolarity, which is which is challenging the the U.S. hegemony, which which the U.S. has very much got used to for the last three decades plus. So it's you know these are really interesting developments. Yeah, I think it is. And again, it's history repeating itself, but of course, not exactly. Uh, and the Cold War had an ideological element, but it also had the element of national interests that put some countries in the crosshairs of imperialism. And sometimes ideology was dominant, and sometimes ideology was used as a pretext for Western aggression. Uh, and sometimes ideology really didn't matter that much. But the national interests of different countries that were targeted by uh, the United States or its military alliance, NATO, uh, it brought them together or in some cases divided them. We're, we want to talk about that. Let's go back, though, to how World War II comes to an end. During the, during the war, the British, capitalist Britain, capitalist in United States, are in alliance with socialist Soviet Union. There was the conference in Yalta. There was, you know, also a conference in Potsdam later, after right after uh, Roosevelt had died. Earlier, there was a conference in Tehran. These were summits between the leaders of Britain, uh, the United States, and the Soviet Union. And during these summits, uh, they were talking about what the post-World War II era would look like. Now, the way it's presented today in American history and probably where you are in British history and certainly in the media is that as the war ended, the alliance broke up between the, these three countries. And the reason it broke up was because Stalin assumed a very aggressive position towards Eastern and Central Europe. There are other people like Oliver Stone who's, and, and Peter Kuznick who did a series on uh, on, a, on the U.S. history, and they make the argument that if Roosevelt had lived and, and hadn't been replaced by Truman, 
uh, maybe the, the wartime alliance would have continued between the US, Britain, uh, and the Soviet Union. Uh, my belief is that this alliance was temporary, it was conjunctural, and it was bound to come apart because the Soviet Union and the United States and Britain weren't just three countries. They were three major powers that represented different social systems that, except during the time of World War II, were in irreconcilable struggle, just the way workers and bosses on the job the social classes, the proletariat and the capitalists are endlessly in struggle. There are temporary truces sometimes. There could be a union contract that you know, mediates the nature of the class war, but these countries represented two different social systems. And you know, when you, and I wanna go over how this kind of breaks apart, but Stalin's foreign policy was not aggressive. It was not aggressive and let's just think about how World War II ends. The Soviets had declared war on Japan in early August 1945, and then about two days later, or, or perhaps the next day, the United States drops the nuclear bomb on Hiroshima, and then another one for good measure on Nagasaki, and clearly the United States is signaling the other powers in the world, including its ally, the Soviet Union, that we have a weapon unlike any other weapon in the world, and you don't have this weapon. And that ushers in the era of nuclear diplomacy, but at a time when the US proved that they're willing to use nuclear weapons and they're the only ones who have them. Again, there's a big debate, and I want you to address it, of whether the use of the atomic bomb was actually not only directed against Japan, but also the opening shot of the new Cold War. In other words, a message to the Soviet Union that we are not going to treat you as an equal because militarily you don't have what we have. Anyway, I want to get your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think it should by now basically be clear to anyone who cares to do a little bit of research that these bombings, these genocidal bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki constituted, the, the, they certainly weren't necessary from a military point of view. You know, they constituted a cynical power move, a political offensive by the US. Uh, you know, what the Allies had agreed on at the conferences, as you said, in Yalta, in Tehran, in Potsdam, was that the Allies would collectively defeat Japan, which by this point was occupying Korea, large points, parts of China, the Philippines, um, Indochina, Burma, Malaya, uh, the so-called Dutch East Indies, what's now Indonesia. And the Soviets had agreed that they would enter the war against Japan three months after victory in Europe, that is, early August 1945. And the US were going to occupy the Southern Islands, the Soviet troops would occupy the Northern Islands, and the fascist Japanese government would be forced to surrender, and its war machine would be dismantled. Um, you know, and by this point, Japan was on the verge of surrender, you know, its occupation regimes that it had in Northeast China, in, in Korea, in Vietnam, they were already collapsing. So to drop two nuclear bombs, indiscriminately killing over a quarter of a million people, which, you know, by the way, is is just a little bit less than the total number of US war dead. I mean, it appears to be not much more than an act of cold-hearted mass murder. Um, and, you know, and furthermore, is an act that the US still hasn't apologized for. But, you know, let, let's look at why they did it. You know, let's assume it wasn't simply, you know, an act of psychopathology and that they're just sort of nasty people. Um, yeah, yes, there was a, a sort of local tactical element, which was to deprive the Soviet Union of any influence in post-war Japan. You know, if the Soviets had occupied the North Islands, if they'd occupied Hokkaido, they would have supported the anti-fascist resistance, a significant part of which was, was connected with the Japanese Communist Party, um, and the hand of the popular forces would have been strengthened, right? So ending the war before the Red Army arrived meant ensuring a sort of a US-aligned capitalist Japan. You know, in the US's terms, it meant ensuring a a democratic Japan. You know, of course, the government that was installed was profoundly undemocratic, but that's another story. But the global, the, the broader, the strategic aspect that you've touched on of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was the assertion of US military supremacy and its bid for hegemony. You know, After four years of alliance against Nazism, the US was setting the scene for the Cold War in a, you know, in a very brutal and a very cynical way. You know, the, the the Soviets had, to all intents and purposes, won the war, right? They'd lost millions of people. 
millions more rendered homeless, people living in caves, living in trenches, infrastructure wiped out, economy shattered. Um, meanwhile, the US has suffered pretty minimal losses. It only carried out its landings after Stalingrad, you know, once it's pretty clear that the Germans are going to be defeated. The Normandy landings were in June 44. So by which time Kiev, Crimea, Minsk have all been liberated, you know, the, the Red Army is on its way to Budapest. So with Hiroshima, the US announces that this wartime alliance against fascism is over and it's switching back to its default geostrategic posture, which you've talked about, which is containing the Soviet Union, containing socialism. Um, and and that the bombs themselves brought a message of a new balance of power in the world. You know, whatever we agreed as the, the big powers, as allies at Yalta, at Tehran, at Potsdam, that isn't so relevant anymore. You know, the, the basis for, for that diplomacy was the different size record on the battlefield. You know, it was, I think, General Jap who, who commented, you know, you can't win on the negotiating table what you haven't already won on the battlefield. But Hiroshima changed that calculus. So one side now has this game-changing new weaponry, on which basis it can engage in atomic diplomacy, on which basis it can change what's been agreed and it can leverage in the Balkans, in Germany and further afield. You know, it's, it's almost immediately after Hiroshima in, in, I think, October 45, that the US and Britain start reneging on the previous agreements about the balance of forces in Europe. Um, so I think that's the major uh, significance of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in geopolitical terms. It heralds the start of the new Cold War, of, oh, sorry, of the Cold War. Yes, and, and again, I think this is important to go over with people because, again, the image is the Cold War was prompted by Stalin's hardline position, his refusal to compromise, uh, his pushing communism on the people of Eastern and Central Europe and elsewhere, promoting revolutions everywhere. <laughs> and the United States was on the defensive, the West was on the defensive, the democracies were on the defensive in the face of this rising tide of Soviet aggressiveness. But when you actually look at what happened and what happened not only in Europe but also in Asia, Stalin's policy or the policy of the Soviet Union, Stalin was at that time still the you know, the principal a political leader in the Soviet Union. It was a very restrained policy. I would say a conservative policy, certainly not a revolutionary policy, and a policy that did not desire confrontation and, in fact, was willing to, in some ways, sacrifice the struggles of the socialist or communist forces in other countries who were... In the, in the aftermath of World War II, struggling to take power themselves. And I believe the Soviet leadership was afraid that if any other socialist revolutions took place right after World War II, that the West would blame Moscow, like this giant communist conspiracy hatched in Moscow. And the Soviets, having just recovered or trying to recover from World War II, feared that it would start World War III when they were still weak, when they had lost 27 million, as you pointed out, when they had suffered such grave losses and they wanted peace. The Soviets were willing to do almost anything uh, for peace. And I want to talk about some specific examples of how this manifested. Okay, World War II, the, the magnitude of the violence, unprecedented in human history, 80 million, maybe 90, 100 million people are dead. The former colonial empires that dominated the world when Lenin wrote his book in 1916, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, those colonial empires were fragmenting. The Europe, uh, Britain, France, of course, Spain, Italy, uh, Holland, uh, Japan too, all of these countries were basically torn apart by the war and the sub subjugated, colonized people were rising up all over the world, demanding freedom, demanding independence, demanding to no longer be colonial subjects. And th this had the effect of sort of putting the United States on the defensive. It was not the consequence of some conspiracy hatched by Stalin and the Politburo in Moscow, if anything, they feared a growing global confrontation as a consequence of this move to the left. Just like World War ended with revolution, a revolution in Russia and also a revolution in Germany, 
a revolution in Hungary. Those two were not successful, unlike the Bolsheviks, but there was revolution. Now it was global revolution, China, Vietnam, Korea, but also Greece. Uh, the Greek communists were fighting against a British-backed reactionary government. In Italy and France, where the, the bourgeoisie had basically thrown its lot in with Nazism and fascism, it was the armed resistance movements led by, uh, by communist parties that were really carrying the day. And in the void, in the vacuum of other established state power, they could have potentially made a bid for state power. But in, when you look at these different uh, situations, we had in Greece, the, the Soviet leadership was not really supportive of the Greek communist move to take power. In the case of Italy and France, they counseled those ma major massive communist parties not to go for state power, but instead to uh, be a, a part of a functioning capitalist parliamentary system. And in the case of China, uh, the Stalin government, as agreed to at Yalta, said Chiang Kai-shek, now Mao Zedong, was the legitimate and sole representative government in China and urged the Communist Party to, to negotiate with Chiang Kai-shek, even though they clearly were on the, on the verge of taking power and indeed four years, did, four years later did take power. But you can see that what, what Stalin really wanted was peace. And even in Eastern Europe, Carlos, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Romania, even Eastern Germany, uh, which was under a, a Soviet zone of control, between 1945 and 1948, the Stalin leadership in the Soviet Union was not prioritizing the socialization of those countries. They would have been content with having those countries become neutral. Only perhaps in Yugoslavia, where the indigenous revolutionary thrust led by Tito and the partisans was basically going full scale for a socialist revolution. Anyway, when you look at those uh, actual struggles, Greece, Italy, France, China, uh, not an aggressive foreign policy. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. You know, I would argue that what the Soviets were pursuing was essentially a form of peaceful coexistence. You know, the, that's an idea that's generally attributed to Khrushchev, and certainly he's packaged the idea up and sort of staked his reputation on it. But really, it starts before that. And, and you know, I, I think peaceful coexistence is a running theme throughout the history of actually existing socialism. Lenin wanted peaceful coexistence too. And it just reflects an understanding of the balance of forces. If the major capitalist countries haven't had socialist revolutions, if they aren't on the cusp of socialist revolutions, then the alternative to peaceful coexistence between the two systems is, is war between the two systems. Um, and you know, as of August 1945, you've got a new factor that we've been talking about, i.e. nuclear weapons. So all of a sudden, war has an even greater weight than it previously did, because it can literally mean the destruction of humanity. And, you know, I think that's the context for Soviet thinking in relation to France, Italy, Greece and, and, and China. You know, in, in France and Italy, as you've said, the, the communist parties were by far the strongest, the most coherent political forces. Um, you know, both had led the anti-fascist resistance, both had extremely broad support amongst the working class, both were in a position to seize power and to, to set up socialist governments. But a cold-headed assessment of the situation says that if either the PCI or the PCF seizes power, that's going to lead pretty quickly to a civil war. And we know perfectly well that in that situation, the US, the Britain, are going to intervene militarily on the side of the bourgeoisie. I mean, their troops are literally occupying these countries. Um, you know, in Italy, the Yugoslavs and the Soviets would then be pulled into a war in support of the working class forces. And, you know, it's, it's impossible to predict what would have happened, other than to say it would have been an extremely precarious and extremely dangerous situation that could have, you know, could well have triggered another major war. Um, so in that sense, I think it's quite understandable and justifiable that Stalin's advice to the French and to the Italians was something along the lines of avoid armed insurrection at all costs, you know, and, and, and the PCI and the PCF did end up joining broad coalition governments as, as relatively junior partners with a status well below what they might have expected on the basis of, of their level of popular support. Um, as for Greece, you know, 
the 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 conferences in 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 Potsdam they 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 accepted some idea of spheres of influence whereby um you know the the Soviet Union would essentially be allowed to have a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe and the Balkans and the 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 western powers would be able to have a sphere of influence in western Europe but that would include Greece right you know the the Soviets would be able to um would have relatively free reign in the Balkans but they had to give you know they had to give Britain free reign when it came to Greece which is a very diff- very bitter pill to swallow um you know, because at this time the Greek Communist Party, which have again led the anti-fascist resistance, was suffering a massive onslaught from the British occupying forces, and actually disagreements over Greece were were a big part of the early split between the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, because Tito was was very keen to see an intervention by the socialist camp. So, yeah, it was the Soviets were pursuing a very cautious, uh, uh, realistic, you know, foreign policy that was focused very strongly on consolidating existing gains rather than trying to score major kind of fresh new victories. Indeed. And and we have a situation where uh, the Soviets were routinely and endlessly regularly frustrated when the United States would not uh, allow the countries of Poland and the other border countries uh, on the western side of the Soviet Union, the same countries through which the Nazi invasion had struck the Soviet Union in June 1941. Uh, Stalin and the Soviets wanted those to be neutral countries, like Austria, perhaps, or like Finland, where there was an agreement that these countries would not allow to would not be allowed to become a staging ground once again for for Western imperialist powers that threatened or would invade, literally invade the Soviet Union once again. What what the Soviets wanted was, and what Stalin, I believe, wanted was not a socialist Poland or even a socialist Czechoslovakia or a socialist Romania. They wanted a buffer zone whereby those countries would not be used by the Western powers, especially the United States and Britain, or reactionaries aligned with them to launch another invasion. And when, when you think about it, I mean, the Soviet Union was invaded by 14 imperialist armies after the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. That was in 1918. Three million Soviet citizens from the different republics, Russia and the others, died in that war, that so-called civil war, but 14 imperial armies invaded. 20 years later, the Nazis invade once again after the Soviets uh, don't succeed in getting France and Britain and the United States to enter into collective security agreements against fascism. Uh, And now the U.S. drops the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and obviously is preparing to be an aggressor policy. By the way, what the United States, a lot of people don't know about this, the day before Japan surrenders on August 15th, 1945, the Japanese have this unconditional surrender, right? Hiroshima comes first, a week later Nagasaki, the two nuclear bombs, Japan surrenders unconditionally to the U.S. But the day before, on August 14th, the U.S. issues General Order Number 1. And General Order Number 1 stipulates that the Japanese colonial forces in China and in Korea and in other Asian countries should remain in place to make sure that the communists, the local indigenous rebels, the workers and peasants and their political parties not take the power. So if you look at general order number one, where, by the way, the Japanese fully complied. They kept in place. So the U.S. defeats uh, Japanese, uh, the Japanese empire, but tells the empire stay in place so that you can continue to fight and oppress Chinese people and Korean people and other peoples who are living under occupation because We don't want there to be a political vacuum because that political vacuum will be filled by the left, just as it would have been in Italy uh, or Greece or France at the end of World War II. So when you look at this entire era, this entire policy, Stalin wants a buffer zone in Eastern Europe, not because he's trying to promote or export socialism, just so that it won't be a staging ground. 
And in response to General Order Number 1, the U.S. has this very aggressive policy telling the Japanese Empire, stay in place till we can replace your troops. And while Stalin could perhaps direct the Italian and French party or deprive the Greek uh, movement of arms necessary to fight the British uh, for the reasons you sa said, in other words, he wanted to maintain the status quo rather than go into World War III, the, the revolutions in Vietnam, in North Korea or Korea, and in China had their own dynamic. And those people were going to fight the Japanese or the Americans who took the place of the Japanese or the French or whoever the colonial power was because World War II unleashed this amazing leftist revolutionary energy. And in many places, the liberation movements were led by communists, communists who would have looked to the Soviet Union but they weren't looking to the Soviet Union right now and saying, hey, what should we do? They knew what they wanted to do, which was to take the power. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, uh, you know, quite a few threads to pick up there. Um, I mean, in relation to the Soviet policy in Eastern Europe, I think it's a, it's a much misunderstood area of history. And, and, and it's unfortunate that mainstream history has kind of turned Eastern and Central Europe in the post-war period into a sort of single, undifferentiated mass, you know, a, a, a Soviet bloc or even a Soviet empire, you know, um, even countries that explicitly broke with the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia and Albania, are thought of in in much the same sort of way. You know, uh, I think it's it's absolutely correct to say that the Soviets weren't pushing for socialism in Eastern Europe. They favoured strategically neutral coalition governments representing different political parties and social classes. Of course, um, certain components, certain political trends were excluded from that. Of course, fascists were excluded. Of course, um, you know, people who'd collaborated with the Nazis during the war were excluded. And of course, fanatically, anti-Soviet and anti-Russian governments wouldn't be acceptable to the Soviet Union from a, from a basic security point of view. Um, you know, have, having won the war, having liberated these territories in Europe, the Soviet Union can hardly be expected to kind of facilitate the emergence of new breeding grounds for war against it. Um, and yeah, sure, the, the old ruling classes of Eastern Europe didn't have a seat at the table because they'd aligned themselves with the Nazis during the war. And you know, from, from a standpoint of democracy, from a standpoint of, of progress, there's no need to be wistful or nostalgic about that. You know, we're talking about archaic aristocratic cliques who were pretty happy to reign over the most horrifying poverty, ruthless oppression and generalized backwardness, you know, so long as they could live in palaces and enjoy ostentatious wealth and, and ridiculous privilege. But the idea of, of Soviet policy in Europe was that these countries would be neutral, that they'd adopt systems of government that were suitable to their national conditions and the prevailing balance of forces. And actually, the, the, the model of government that they that they supported that they proposed um, was people's democracy. You know that the, they they felt that that would be a system that should be acceptable to the U.S. and to Britain. That was that spanned multiple classes, that spanned multiple political stables and perspective. They they specifically wanted to avoid confrontation. They specifically wanted to avoid a cold war. Um, so you know these these coalitions were set up. But the Western powers made it clear from the offset that they didn't accept that system of people's democracy. And they got to work undermining those governments, stoking the flames of civil war, stoking the flames of class conflict, supporting any kind of anti-Soviet and anti-communist elements they could find. Meanwhile, the communists in these countries enjoyed a lot of prestige. In most cases, they'd led the anti-fascist resistance. In government, they got to work res just responding to the needs of the people, recovering from the nightmare of war, recovering from the nightmare of occupation, developing programs of land reform, literacy, education, industrialization, employment, you know, and generally promoting economic and social advancement. So in a sense, by the late 40s, you know, the, the Eastern Europe and the Balkans and Central Europe adopting socialist governments is is more than anything the consequence of Western hostility. You know, it's the West's hostility and efforts at destabilization that rendered this hybrid system of people's democracy unviable. You know, while the, at the same time the communist parties, the socialist parties have gained popularity, gained strength, 
And that's how they came, how, how those countries came to join the socialist camp. That wasn't the plan, you know, that wasn't the proposal in 1945 to paint Eastern Europe red. But that's how it worked out. And, and the West's intransigence and its hostility to the Soviet proposal of, of a neutral buffer zone is a big part of the reason. Indeed. So we, we have this effort by the Soviets, again, a non-revolutionary, non-aggressive foreign policy. The, the part that's aggressive is they're like putting their foot down, a little bit like what's happening right now with Russia, with Putin and Ukraine, where they're saying, look, we're not going to let this area through which the Nazis invaded and, and through which that military engagement took the lives of 27 million of our people. We're not going to let this territory be used once again by the reactionary elites who align themselves with fascism to become a staging ground for you, the United States, with your nuclear arsenal. We're not going to let that happen. But again, the United States was so aggressive, would be so uncompromising, similarly to the way it is now with Ukraine and, and the other countries in Eastern Europe where the U.S. is just pushing endlessly east towards Russia. So it makes confrontation in a way more or less inevitable. Now, at the same time this is happening, as I mentioned, the revolution in Asia from India, from Indonesia, Vietnam, Korea, China, it's bursting out. And the United States really is in a way, on its back heel. And there's nothing really the Soviets could do, even if they wanted to do it. And, you know, we don't even need to speculate about it. We do know that in the case of China, the Soviet policy was to acknowledge that Chiang Kai-shek was the sole legitimate government. And the Soviets, in fact, signed a treaty of friendship in 1945 at the end of the war with the Chiang Kai-shek government. And this is when the Red Army, led by by Mao and the Communist Party had almost a million members under arms, not a small political force. But it showed there, too, that even though the communists were perhaps politically aligned with the Soviet Union, aligned with the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet leadership was not thinking from the point of view of exporting revolution. They were thinking about geostrategic balancing and also preventing World War III. But, as I mentioned, the revolutionary forces had their own life. In China, they take the power. In 1949, in 1948, the Soviets withdrew from the northern part of Korea, their zone. The U.S. withdrew from the southern part of Korea, which had been its zone of military occupation at the end of World War II. Japan, before that, had been the colonial power. Um, so the Soviets leave, the Americans leave, but the social struggle inside of Korea is also this boiling cauldron, this revolutionary cauldron. And the workers and the peasants are fighting the landlords and the aristocrats and the Sigmund Rhee puppet government in South Korea. Sigmund Rhee had been brought from, I think from Princeton, from New Jersey, to be the new president of the southern part of Korea. So the struggle breaks out, and in June 1950, the Korean War begins. And within three days after June 25th, 1950, after the Northern Korean Army, the People's Army, uh, goes south, within three days, they are almost at the very southern tip of South Korea. They're almost liberating the entire country. And the United States, using the mantle of the UN, um, organizes a counteroffensive. Uh, by the way, just for our listeners, the Soviet Union was boycotting the Security Council at that time where it could have exercised a veto against the use of the UN as the moniker for the invasion of Korea. But it was boycotting the Security Council in solidarity with the People's Republic of China, which had just been formed, but which the United States refused to allow to take its rightful seat in the United Nations, instead letting Chiang Kai-shek and the Rump government in Taiwan be the, quote, legitimate government at the Security Council. So the US, USSR is out of the Security Council. The U.S. uses the U.N. to launch an invasion of South Korea. And then, Carlos, this is really, the I think, the defining moment in what we are calling the global class war, which I think is a more accurate description of what the Western media calls the Cold War, where all of the socialist countries are on the side of North Korea. And all of the major capitalist countries, and most, many of the minor ones, 
are on the side of the United States and South Korea. So in this little part of the planet, in the Korean Peninsula, in what appears to be a skirmish between workers and peasants and their bosses and oppressors and tormentors on this little piece of territory, the whole world comes into the struggle. It is a global class struggle, the socialists on one side uh, and the capitalists on the other. And that, in many ways, becomes a defining moment for the next period of, of world politics. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And, and another thing to consider about the Korean War is that it really, it's the starting point of the, the U.S. military industrial complex, which I think we still you know, recognize has, 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 has basically continued from that point to this day. You know, the U.S. Had, had grown fat off war profits in World War II. Vast portions of the economy were given over to military production. You're all paid for with taxpayer money, all enormously profitable. You know, uh, nobody talked about it in these terms, but really it's the quintessential example of military Keynesianism, this idea of massive state-led investments in the business of war. Yeah. And it's a kind of, uh, it's slightly off topic, but in many ways, it's good business. You know, it serves multiple functions for capitalism. It's a very neat way of fun funneling wealth to the rich. Everyone pays their taxes and their fiscal revenue is invested in this lucrative group of businesses. And it has knock-on effects, so, you know, around the economy. You build war planes, you need steel, you need plastics, you need engines, you need oil, and so on. So, and, and actually, when you take a closer look at some of the most famous technical innovations that have come out of the U.S., they emerge precisely out of the military industrial complex, the, the internet being an obvious example. Um, and, and that military industrial complex, which comes into its own in Korea, provides then the basic infrastructure for maintaining the imperialist world system. You know, if it weren't for war, if it weren't for covert war, the threat of war, how different would the second half of the 20th century have looked? You know, how many countries would have taken the socialist road? How many people wouldn't have died in Korea or Vietnam or Laos or Cambodia or Indonesia or Brazil or Chile or South Africa or Algeria? You know, uh, you know people talk about the Cold War and it wasn't actually always that cold. Um, and aside from that, this ridiculous military spending and the, the military innovation in the West forced a response from the Soviet Union, which now has the responsibility not only of defending itself, but defending its allies around the world. And military spending might be good economics under capitalism, but it's spectacularly bad economics under socialism, you know, when the basic objective of your economic system is to provide goods and services to people, then devoting resources to a project that doesn't improve people's living standards is a disaster. You know, much better to have someone building houses or harvesting wheat or teaching Italian or writing books or whatever than building warplanes. And that's kind of the economics of the arms race that, you know, maybe we'll get into in a, in a later episode. The US wants to outspend the Soviet Union at zero cost to US capitalism and massive cost to Soviet socialism. And yeah, as I say, Korea was where, where all of this, where this military industrial complex got its big boost. You know, it's just five years after the end of World War II, but it's a much more high-tech war. Napalm is used in huge quantities for the first time. Um, the wars fought largely in the air for the first time. It certainly included a very serious threat of nuclear bombing. So Korea provided the military industrial complex with this green light to step up its operations in a big way. And, and, and it's carried on ever since. You know, Eisenhower famously in his farewell address in, um, in 1961 talks about the growing influence of the military industrial complex, how think tanks and lobbyists are inflating the threat posed by other countries in order to justify um, these enormous investments in weaponry. And, and don't we see that today, you know, including under your supposedly progressive Biden administration that's just signed off the largest military bu budget in history of what, $780 million, uh, billion dollars. So the US has you know, moved seamlessly from its Cold War to the war on terror to the new Cold War. Um, and it's all part of the same dynamic of preserving, protecting, expanding the imperialist system. I'm so glad that you mentioned the military industrial complex because it then incentivizes even more aggression because as you put it, it's, it's very good for business. After World War II, the U.S. military had demobilized. It's only with the Korean War where this permanent warfare state 
uh, comes into in, into existence, and again, it, it's never left. And and it it's also important, um, Carlos, because because it does mean that there's always an economic incentive for capitalism to keep the danger or threat of war ever present. Because if you're going to tell the American people, for instance, look, we're going to spend $800 billion of your money this year, and yeah, half of you are either in or near poverty, which is the, the economic statistics developed by the Poor People's Campaign, which I believe are realistic statistics. But yeah, we're going to take $800 billion of your tax dollars because our country is at risk. You know, your security depends on this kind of expenditure. Like, that's the only way you can sell it. And in order to sell it, you have to have enemies. And, you know, at a certain point, you know, when the Soviet Union did collapse, I think the U.S. was shocked because one of the, one of the, one of the threats of the end of the Cold War was how are we going to justify the continued expenditure of so much money for death and destruction. But, of course, we know they found creative ways to overcome that. Uh, and again, as you pointed out, and we'll talk about this when we get into the last segment or segments of our series, because we're going to talk, we're going to go back to your book, The End of the Beginning, which is why the Soviet Union collapsed. The arms race had a very, very profound impact and a negative impact on socialism. There aren't uh, capitalist corporations in the Soviet Union making tons of money uh, and profits from, from war spending. It's actually just a big drain away from consumer products. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. I want to bring us more as we're coming to the close of this era, this very sort of decisive fork in the road in terms of Soviet U.S. politics, the Cold War or the global class struggle. Again, Part of the thing that we're trying to accomplish here is to demonstrate that it wasn't the Soviet and Soviet aggression or uh, aggressiveness that caused the Cold War, that this was, in fact, an act of aggression by the imperialist powers led now by the United States. Uh, we have, of course, right now, as we started this show, a confrontation looming between NATO and Russia in Ukraine. And Ukraine, of course, is a uh, shares a 1,200-mile border with Russia. It was the second largest republic in the Soviet Union after Russia. It was, in many ways, the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. And now NATO or NATO forces are basically dominating the government and threatening to put you know, advanced weapons with a flight time of a couple minutes towards their so Russian targets. Uh, we have a, a situation where uh, you know, NATO was still in existence 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And we did a show last week with Eugene Perrier where we said abolish NATO because NATO is, in fact, the threat. But let's go back to how NATO forms. It forms in 1949. I, well, I actually don't want to talk so much about how NATO forms since we did that last week. I want to talk about how the Soviets respond. The Warsaw Pact, which is sort of the mirror, the the equivalent of NATO by the socialist countries, a military alliance led by the Soviet Union, forms in 1955. And then the United States always projects that the Warsaw Pact is a grave danger to the people of Western Europe, and NATO must be reinforced and constantly you know, reinvigorated with ever more funds to defend Western Europe from a Warsaw Pact invasion. But again, let's talk about how the Warsaw Pact was formed the reasons for it, again, it was six years after NATO was formed in 1949. Yeah, I mean, one thing I guess we need to touch on with NATO is that it's what it represents is the imperialist powers, the Western imperialist powers coming together, putting aside their differences and agreeing on a strategy of shared hostility under U.S. leadership, undisputed U.S. leadership. To, um, to the Soviet Union and to the socialist world. Um, you know, there's the, all of a sudden they're flying a single banner of anti-communism, which is, which is a new phenomenon. And, and it's worth, worth consideration because in, in, in terms of this, this global class war, this global class struggle, that's very important that the, the imperialist side turned out to be uh, particularly good at uniting, better in fact than our side. 
you know, Lenin had talked about the three contradictions of imperialism between labor and capital, between the imperialist countries and the oppressed countries, and among the imperialist countries themselves, inter-imperialist rivalry. Um, and strategically, it's always been very important to kind of take advantage of inter-imperialist rivalry from, from you know, from a, from a communist perspective. So 1945 comes around and the rivalry was was put on hold, right? The US, Western Europe, Japan join forces to form you know what Samir Amin, Samir Amin talks to talks about as the triad of the, the imperialist world system. Um, you know, and, and this is US imperialism going global for the first time, which is another big change from the Monroe Doctrine, which has been in place for the best part of a century, asserting US hegemony in the American continent. Um, now all of a sudden you've got US troops stationed all over Europe and then a genocidal war in Korea, and then a genocidal war in Indochina. And it's all predicated on this absurd notion that the Soviet Union's on the verge of sending its armies into Western Europe, you know, that the Soviet Union is a fundamentally aggressive force, which I I think pr- literally nobody in US policymaking circles actually believed. But it provided the basic fuel that NATO, NATO needed to get going and to justify itself, you know, well, the, the US quadrupled its military budget in the matter of a couple of years. It built up its stockpiles of atomic bombs. It encouraged West, uh, West Germany to rearm, even though the majority of NATO members didn't even want that. Um, so, you know, NATO provided this military umbrella for Western Europe um, and a sort of pseudo-legal pretext for hosting US troops and US weaponry, including u- nuclear missiles, on European soil. Um, and, and, and providing this military architecture of the, of the Cold War. Um, meanwhile, you know, the, the Soviets have been very clear all, all along. You know, 1949, NATO is formed. Um, the Soviets even tried to, to join NATO. You know, the, that's the reality is that the Soviet, the Soviet foreign policy architecture is completely focused on peace. It completely rejects the idea of war, Cold War and hot war. Um, it doesn't want Soviet or US troops in Europe. It does want a reunified, neutral Germany. You know, um, what the plan presented by Molotov in 1954 was, okay, yeah, so you say you want a common security architecture in Europe. Well, you know, we all want that. We all want peace. And peace has to be based on a system of collective security. But it's not going to be a lasting peace if we divide Europe down the middle into two competing blocks that are irrevocably hostile to each other. So let's have a pan-European collective security treaty that includes Poland and France, it includes Hungary, and it includes Britain, and a reunified Germany. And, and you know, so the US shut down that proposal pretty much immediately, saying that this would disrupt NATO. So the Soviets said, okay, let us join NATO, you know, let NATO give up its aggressive stance towards us. And then NATO can work in tandem with a with a pan European security treaty. Um, so you know it's a it's a sort of last ditch attempt by the Soviets to create a stable peace, to reduce tensions, to accelerate the reunification of Germany. Um, you know, and on that point again, the Soviet po- the Soviet policy was very consistent. The German people wanted reunification. The Soviets supported reunification. They suggested all foreign troops should be withdrawn from Germany. West Germany's membership of NATO should be repealed, um, and there should be free and universal elections to decide the government. You know, it was the Western powers that rejected that, not the Soviets, um, just as they rejected all Soviet proposals for collective security and a lasting peace. So in a sense, the formation of the Warsaw Pact, or you know, more properly the Warsaw, Warsaw Treaty Organization in 1955, was a response to this series of rejections of, of, of the Soviet approaches to peace, um, you know, a, a response to NATO's highly aggressive stance and also specifically to West Germany's rearmament and its incorporation into NATO. You know, West Germany was incorporated into NATO literally a week before the formation of, of the Warsaw Pact. Czechoslovakia, Poland, East Germany in particular faced what must have felt like a very serious threat from the presence of NATO troops on their borders. So, you know, the underlying principle of the pact is, well, if you're going to maintain US troops on a long-term basis in Western Europe, 
then the Soviet Union's going to need to maintain its troops on a long term basis in Eastern Europe. You know, we've made any number of reasonable proposals for collective security. We've supported German reunification. We've supported the removal of US and Soviet troops from the continent. You've rejected all of them. So now we're in a position where we have to respond. I mean, as a group of countries, we're under attack, we're under threat, and we'll organize ourselves to, to resist that threat. You know, and I, I guess there's a parallel, and there's, there's a kind of obvious and maybe slightly superficial parallel between NATO on the one hand and the Warsaw Pact on the other. You know, NATO is the military architecture of the Cold War in the West, and the Warsaw Pact is the military architecture of Cold War in the East. Um, and that tends to be how it's presented in mainstream history. But actually, you know, the it's not a contest of equals. You know, the two sides aren't equally to blame for this conflict. Like, and and I think that's absolutely key to understand and to reiterate. The socialist countries wanted peace. The post-colonial countries wanted peace. Everyone wanted sovereign development, the right to develop peacefully according to a model of their own choosing. There was one political force disrupting that. And it was the US-led imperialist system which precisely wanted to contain socialism and to prevent sovereign development. You know, John Foster Dulles, who was, as you know, Secretary of State from 53 to 59, was quite explicit about it. He said, we want to push socialism back to the borders of the USSR. The imperialists were not interested in peace. They were interested in hegemony. And 70 years later, that continues to be the case. Very, very important for people who are progressive, who are anti-war, to know these facts, that the Soviet policy was to support the reunification of Germany, that Soviets offered to join NATO, that they offered that all U.S. and Soviet troops leave the continent of Europe. I mean, these were the proposals of the Soviet Union, again, demonstrating that when you look at the facts, that the Soviets were not the aggressors. They were responding to these endless provocations and institutionalized threats from the United States and from NATO. We've covered a lot of ground, Carlos, and uh, we'll cover a lot more. But I wanted to I wanted to conclude this this episode with sort of sort of figuring out where we end up by the end of the 1950s. Uh, again, we'll go into more detail in the next episode about the the split that happens between the Soviet Union and China and the role of the United States and NATO in that political split, because that, again, is the context. The threat posed by imperialism against all of the socialist countries is, in fact, the context. Each of them is trying to figure out how to mitigate uh, or reduce the threat to them. Uh, For a while, they forge solidarity. After a while, the solidarity starts to unravel. We'll talk about that. But there's another element of this story as we as we conclude, which I think is really important for people to recognize. Ten years after the war ends in World War II, the Soviet economy is really getting back on its feet. In spite of all of the losses, the strides made by the Soviet people in the realm of income, education, medical care, housing, which of course there were a lot of housing problems, a lot of housing shortages, Uh, still a much poorer country, still recovering, but huge strides in so many social and economic fields for the average person, uh, for the workers, for those who worked in the countryside. And such amazing technological uh, advances such that in 1957, The Soviets take the world by surprise by launching Sputnik, the first vehicle that enters outer space. And you could see uh, when you read the the news accounts of that time, the the U.S. presentation of the Russians was that they were a poor, backward, illiterate peasant country. But suddenly they're ahead of the United States in terms of uh, entering outer space. And so that becomes, again, the, the war cry for a massive arms race. And, of course, the, the U.S. has incorporated most of the Nazi scientists, literally through Operation Paperclip, brought them to the United States, gave them a new identity. They were the ones who, who constructed NASA in the, in the U.S. space program. They were, in large, more than 1,600 Nazi scientists. So the U.S. used Sputnik as a way to accelerate the arms race. So, anyway, we have a situation where the Soviets are back on their feet, They're making technological progress. In spite of all of the threats, they're doing better. 
And then this event takes place that again changes world politics and again demonstrates the global class character of politics. And that, of course, would be the victory in Cuba of the July 26th movement led by Fidel and Che and Raul and Camilo Cienfuegos and the other revolutionaries. They overthrow the Batista government. They take Havana on January 1st, 1959. And immediately the United States plans to overthrow them, to destroy them, to use covert <laughs> and overt operations. Uh, all kinds of tricks. And over the next year or two, the United States sends terrorists. The U.S. launches the invasion of the Bay of Pigs. Um, anyway, all of that is taking place. Cuba's 90 miles from the United States. Uh, the United States had conquered Cuba in 1898, 1899. Clearly, Cuba would have been destroyed because of the relationship of forces between a country at that time of 9 million a small island 90 miles from the biggest superpower in the world. But Cuba could reach over and find support within the Soviet Union. And in spite of the fact that the Soviet leadership wanted peaceful coexistence, wanted to avoid confrontation, there was a class bond that existed between the Soviet Union, led by a communist party, and the emerging revolution in Cuba. And suddenly socialism has a, has a seed planted in the Western Hemisphere. And again, it, it's a demonstration, Carlos, and we'll, I don't want to overdo it right now, but I do want to just end with this. The Cuban Revolution shows that in spite of the Soviets' desire for a non-aggressive foreign policy, to the extent that people are fighting for freedom, whether it's in, in, in Cuba or the Dominican Republic or the Congo or Vietnam or Korea, the Soviet Union becomes, in a way, a natural ally because of the class character of their revolutions and the class character of the socialist camp. And this, again, becomes a defining part of the next era. Go ahead. You get the final word, by the way. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, th I think it would be difficult to overstate how important of a step forward the Cuban Revolution was you know, for our side, for the global working class, for the masses on the road to socialism. Um, you know, it was obviously the first socialist revolution in the West, not not just the Americas, but the first socialist country west of Berlin. Um, and furthermore, as you say, you know, 90 miles from the US. And and it's, it's impact, you know, it's had such an outsized impact, you know, from 59 onwards. It's been the major inspiration for revolutionary movements in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's been a crucial source of support for those movements and those projects, those countries. You know, the Grenadian Revolution in 1979, the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua, Unidad Popular in Chile. You know, Cuba was was a huge inspiration to Hugo Chavez and to the Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela. Um, and for this whole wave that we're seeing now of, of progressive advance in Latin America over the last two decades. So, yeah, as I say, you know, it's a small country, population maybe 11 million but with an outsized influence in, in terms of the global class war, in terms of humanity's trajectory towards socialism, um, and that I would argue has provided some of the best, maybe the best kind of most advanced working class leadership over the course of the last six decades, um, and is a country that has sort of bridged the gap between 20th century socialism and 21st century socialism, you know, the Cubans have been able to update their model, update their understanding, maintain the connection between the leadership and the masses, maintain popular engagement in a way that ultimately, you know, the Soviets in, in the latter period failed to do. Um, so in terms of the period that we've been talking about today, you know, it ends on a high you know, with the Cuban revolution, with the socialist world now extending from Havana in the West to Pyongyang in the East and incorporating you know, about a third of the world's territory, incorporating about a third of the world's population. Um, and, you know, this is a socialist world that's connected to and supportive of national liberation struggles and post-colonial states around the world. You know, in, okay, in 1959, 1960, you can hear the first rumblings of the Sino-Soviet split if you're listening very carefully and you know who to listen to. But I don't think anyone imagined that it would become basically unsalvageable as it did pretty much a couple of years later. Overall, I think it must have felt like a very hopeful, a very hopeful moment full of possibility, full of excitement.
Indeed. We'll, we'll come back, as I said, in our next episode and talk about the Sino-Soviet split, the split between the Soviet Union and China, the two largest countries in the socialist camp. We'll talk about why that happened, the impact that it happened. Uh, we're going to do all that. But I want to thank Carlos Martinez. And again, I want to urge uh, people who are watching us or listening to us to get his book. It's the end of the beginning, Lessons of the Soviet Collapse. Uh, this is the book. I really urge people to get their hands on the book. And we're going to continue to talk with Carlos uh, in the coming period. We'll talk about the Sino-Soviet split. And then we want to talk about what were the different political and economic factors that led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Of course, the imperialists and the apologists of capitalism say it was the end of history, uh, that it was the last effort really to, to have some system other than capitalism. But as Carlos Martinez uh, rightly says in his book title, it wasn't the end of history, it was the end of the beginning. And I would say the end of the beginning of real human history, what the working class and the poor, the majority, actually take the reins of power. Carlos Martinez, thank you so much. Thank you.